And we'll get a screen share going here. All right, I think what we'll do is pick up where we left off last time. Go to my notes. The quart notes from 312. That would be quant notes, I believe. All right, so this is kind of where we were last time. So I just wanted to pick up here. And this is, I think, going to make a lot more sense now because we've actually done the lab at this point. So everybody's kind of seeing what happens here. So <clears throat> just to remind ourselves of what's going on here, um, the analyte in the lab that we did yesterday is iron 2 plus. OK, and that was given to you as an unknown. And what you'll remember and hopefully you wrote down as an observation, is that it initially is colorless, all right? So remember, the whole idea here is that we want to do visible spectroscopy with it. So what that means is that it needs to absorb light in the visible part of the spectrum. Now, the problem, of course, with something being colorless is that colorless things don't absorb light in the visible spectrum. Light passes straight through them, all right? So what we need to do is we need to make the iron absorb light. OK, so that's what's going to happen. So what we do is we end up adding an excess of a ligand. OK, so the excess of the ligand is the 110 phenanthrolene. That's the C12H8N2 here. OK, so we make sure that this gets added as an excess reactant. All right, in other words, we want to make sure that um, all of the iron is coordinated with the ligand. And what we're going to end up making is a stoichiometric amount of the octahedral iron 110 phenanthrolene complex, is what, which is what we've got here on the right. OK, so as you guys saw, as soon as we added the um, ligand and we put some other stuff in there as well. OK, so what else did we put in? You guys remind me, what else did we stick in there besides the ligand? And we'll try to figure out what it was in there for. Buffer. So we had some buffer in there. OK. So the idea was um, we wanted to keep um, the solution buffered at a particular pH. Um, the buffer, if I recall, I want to say, I'm trying to remember what it was. Anybody remember what the buffer was? I think it was an acetate buffer, wasn't it? I think I made it with this math. Yeah. So it would have been a basic buffer, wouldn't it? So why would we want a basic buffer in there? Kind of think back to the EDTA here. Why did we want to make the solution basic in that sense? And why might we want to make it basic in this sense? Well, in the EDTA case, why did we go all the way basic? Why did we want to work up around 10, 11 as far as pH went? That was on the quiz, right? So that the EDTA was fully deprotonated? Yeah, so we could fully deprotonate the EDTA. Okay. So if you look at the 110 phenanthrolene, doesn't have any oxygens in it, but what it does have is nitrogens, right? And the nitrogens, of course, are amine type nitrogens, which means that they could be protonated if we're too acidic. So again, we're gonna bind through the electron pairs on the nitrogen, so we don't wanna protonate those nitrogens, because if we do that, then we make a weak complex or no complex at all. So we wanna um, buffer to a basic pH so we can leave those nitrogens deprotonated, right? that means that we can make a stronger complex. So, okay, that's why we put the buffer in there. What was the other thing we put in there? Anybody remember? The hydroxylamine? Yeah, it was hydroxylamine hydrochloride. Now, what that is, is essentially a reducing agent, okay? So the deal is, is if you've got iron ion in solution, it could exist in there as either iron two plus or iron three plus. And since iron two plus is going to be the analyte, and it's also going to be what complex is readily with the 110 phenanthrolene. We want to make sure that any iron that's in there is fully reduced to the iron 2 plus state. So the hydroxylamine hydrochloride is just a reducing agent to ensure that all of the iron ion in there exists as iron 2 plus. Okay, so it converts any iron 3 plus that's in there to iron 2 plus. Okay, so that's why that's in there. Okay, so I think that's everything. All right, so ultimately what you saw is that when all those um, things were added together and you form the complex or the complex ion, 
that appears to be that very deep orange color that you saw. So everybody saw that nice deep reddish orange color. So it's quite abrupt when you actually um, add the iron solution to um, your mix of all the other things. All right, and you found a lambda max for that, right? Anybody remember what the lambda max he used was? 513. Right around 513, 514, somewhere in there. I think that's what most people were getting, okay? Now, why did I need to know what the lambda max was? What was the point of that? So we could measure the maximum absorbance at that. Yeah, basically that's it. So we wanted to know the wavelength at which the complex were to uh, absorb the most light. Now that's important because if we make a standard curve, okay, which is what we did, we want to have the greatest degree of sensitivity in that standard curve. And to get the greatest degree of sensitivity, in order to measure the lowest possible concentrations of iron, I wanna be able to work at a wavelength where I'm getting the maximum absorbance. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? I mean, that sort of makes sense. Cause I mean, if you're gonna measure really, really small concentrations of iron, you wanna be able to make sure that the complex is actually absorbing. So we're gonna pick that wavelength where the um, iron absorbs the most in the complex form. Okay, and you saw that. You actually got to see what the um, spectrum of the iron complex looked like. And then we kind of went to the top of the spectrum where the absorbance was bigger, biggest. And then we um, saw what wavelength that corresponded to. And that was the 513 nanometers. Okay, so then what you did was you set your spec 20 to 513 nanometers. And that's the um, wavelength you tracked for the rest of the experiment. Okay, so that's why we did that. All right. Any questions so far? I mean, this is really just sort of explaining or re-explaining why we did certain things in the lab. Okay, so the next thing we did, guys, was we looked at a series of standards. So we have to prepare the standard curve. So we looked at a series of standards. All right, so we could do those in terms of parts per million of iron, which is what we actually did. You guys prepared those from a 10 part per million standard, right? So you basically had the blank, which had no iron in it. And then you had a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, I think it was a 0.5, a 1.0 and a 2.5, right? And then what did you do? Well, you measured the absorbance of each one of those, right? So you got an absorbance value for each one of those iron standards. And what did you notice about the absorbance as you increased the concentration of the iron? Did the absorbance get bigger or smaller? Bigger. Yeah, it got bigger. And that makes sense because if you increase the concentration, Beer's law says that the absorbance ought to get bigger proportion. Okay, so this all follows Beer's law. Okay, so we see an increase in absorbance as the concentration of the iron gets bigger. And that's because absorbance is proportional to molar concentration through Beer's law. Remember Beer's law says that absorbance is equal to epsilon, which is the molar absorptivity, times the path length times the molar concentration. Okay, so that makes sense. And since we have a proportionality there, we should have a linear relationship now between absorbance and concentration. Now, it doesn't matter if I cast the concentration as um, molarity or parts per million, concentration is concentration. So um, we'll basically still see that linear relationship. Now, my suggestion is that to do this, you guys are gonna wanna use Excel, okay? So we're gonna end up making what's called a standard curve. You're going to use Excel to do this because Excel will give you a very nice representation of the um, equation for the best fit line that you would see. So I'm going to plot the absorbance on the y axis versus the parts per million iron and the x axis. Okay, so it's exactly as our standards were prepared. And you guys know what's going to happen. Basically, the blank by definition is at zero absorbance because you set your spectrometer to 100% transmittance with the blank. 100% transmittance means zero absorbance. And then you've got what we can say, we've got a 0 0.1, we've got a 0 0.2, and then we've got a 0 0.5, 
way out here, I've got a 1.0, and then way out here, I've got a 2.5. So that may not be exactly the scale, but it looks something like that. So what are you going to see? You're going to see an increase linearity. So it's going to be a nice linear trend, hopefully, all the way out to 2.5. So you're going to get something that looks like that. So if I circle those, what you're going to ask Excel to do is to put a best fit line through that. And you're going to also use your um, origin as one of the data points because you did actually acquire it as your blank. So you'll put a best fit line through that, which might look something like that. All right. Now, there's a couple of ways you could do this. Using a standard curve like this, let's say you then measured the absorbance of your unknown and it turned out to be right there, okay? So you have a value of absorbance for your unknown that you measured. Now, graphically speaking, how would I use the standard curve? Well, I would basically just kind of walk across on my um, x-axis here until I hit the line, right? So we intersect the best fit line somewhere thereabouts. And then what I would do is I would just drop the vertical down like this, and wherever that vertical touches the x-axis, that would be the concentration of my unknown. Okay, so that's graphically how we do it. Now, in practice, how do I do it? Well, remember what Excel will give you here is the equation for the best fit line. So I have a y and I have an m times an x plus a b, right? So m is your slope, b is your y-intercept. All right, and Excel gives you that. The other thing Excel will give you, which you should put on there, is the R squared, which is the correlation coefficient, which tells me how close to linearity we really are. In other words, how good our fit is. And an R squared for this might actually end up being like three nines or something like that. And the closer you get to one for your R squared, the better off your linearity is. If you're much lower than like two nines, eh, you probably got a little bit of slop in your data. But generally, these things come out really, really nice. Now, what would that depend on? Well, it depend on, of course, how well you measured your um, absorbances for each of the standards, but it's also going to depend on how well you made your standards up, too. So if you have a lot of slop in the curve, it might well be because um, you didn't make careful measurements in the preparation of the standards. And that would be primarily in the uh, metering out of the iron, right, which you used a burette to do. That's why you use a burette, because that's the one measurement that really matters. Other things that could have happened was maybe you overfilled your flask or maybe you forgot to invert it, this kind of thing. But if you did all those things, you should get a nice linear relationship, okay? And Excel will give you the values of M and D. So you'll know the slope, you'll know the intercept, so you got the equation for the line. So now, using the equation for the line, let's just pull it back over here. So let's just say it's Y is equal to M times X plus B you'll have a value of M, you'll have a value of B, Excel gives you those. So how would I determine the concentration of my unknown? What should I do? So what do I get from my unknown? I measured an absorbance, didn't I? Okay, so where does that go in the equation if I wanna solve for the thing I'm looking for? Would you use it as the X and then find the PPM? So you wanna get X, right? So what you're trying to get is the x-axis. So this x here corresponds to that x there, okay? So what do I want to plug in to get x? You'd want to plug in your absorbance value. Yeah, too. so you got an absorbance that you measure, and that goes into your y, doesn't it, right? Because absorbance is your y-axis, concentration is your x-axis. So yeah, that's exactly what you're going to do. So you're going to solve for x, okay? So how would you do that? So x would equal to my y minus my b, right? Divided by my m, did I do that right? So that's what I would do. Now you're gonna do that for all four of the trials that you did. So remember you did your um, unknown and quadruplicate. So you're gonna do that for each one of your trials. So you do it for trial one, trial two, trial three, and trial four of your unknown. And now the x in parts per million is your answer. So you can generate a mean, a standard deviation, and a 95% confidence limit based on those four observations. So that's what you're gonna do, okay? So everybody see how you're gonna calculate your um, parts per million iron from your standard curve? 
I think this is the first time we've done this. So that's why I'm kind of going over it here. Make sense? Yep. Yep. Okay, excellent. All right, now there's another thing I asked you to do as well. And that's that we need to find an experimental value for epsilon. Now, what is epsilon? Epsilon is the molar absorptivity, right? And we find it in Beer's law. So remember, Beer's law says that absorbance is equal to epsilon times B times C, okay? Now, let's think about what molar absorptivity represents. What did we say about it last time? What is its physical significance? Does anybody remember? What does epsilon mean? What is its, what is its kind of physical meaning? It uh, refers to the absorbance of a uh, of your analyte at a specific wavelength, um, and it's uh, dependent on how much analyte concentration and how much you're going through, which is B. Okay, so that's basically it. It's essentially a property. It refers to a property of the absorbing species. So in our case, what is the absorbing species? What's doing the absorbing? The iron complex? Yeah, it's the complex. It's not just the iron anymore, right? It's the actual iron complex. Because remember, the iron itself doesn't absorb light in the visible part of the spectrum. But the complex does, OK? So we're really talking about the complex here. So what it's telling us is intrinsically how much light will get absorbed by that complex at a certain wavelength, okay? And we'll say at our lambda max, which is what, 513 or whatever you ended up measuring nanometers, okay? So epsilon is dependent on wavelength, right? So the epsilon is gonna be different at a different wavelength, but we chose 513 nanometers. So the epsilon that we're gonna be calculating is for the complex ion measured at 513 nanometers, okay? And it just tells me essentially how much light or how readily light is absorbed by the complex at that wavelength. So like I said, some, some things have a small molar absorptivity, which means they don't absorb a lot of light. Other things have a really, really huge molar absorptivity. And that tells me that those things absorb a whole lot of light. Okay, so the magnitude of the molar absorptivity basically scales with how much light the um, absorbing species can absorb at that wavelength. So that's a property of the absorbing species. Okay, so we want to find it. Now, here's the deal. In a true Beer's law plot, okay, the idea here is that absorbance is going to equal to epsilon times B times C plus zero. Because in all ideality, right, the y-intercept of a Beer's law plot ought to be zero. Now, when you actually plot it out, it may be a non-zero number, but it's going to be really, really, really close to zero. Okay? So basically, what we see is that we can apply a linear fit to this. Like so. All right, so here's the deal. Y is the absorbance. X is the concentration, right? And epsilon times B is your slope, okay? All right, so now if I wanna get, and now the slope comes from the Excel plot, right? 
So we get that from the best fit line. Right, because Excel gives us the value of slope for a standard curve. So we have that, it's a number, right? And if I want epsilon, all I have to do is solve for my epsilon in my equation. And that's going to be the slope divided by B. Okay. Now, let's remember what B is in this case. What is the B? That's my Beer's Law B as opposed to my Y intercept B. What is it? Path length. Uh, yeah. Path length, yeah. Yeah, you got it. Now, did anybody bother to measure the path length on the um, cuvette yesterday? Yeah, a couple were different. So we traded around to get all the same. I had a 1.1 okay. centimeter. Okay, that sounds about right. Usually they, just depending on which one you had, it's usually like 1.00 centimeters up to about 1.20 centimeters, just kind of depending on which one you got. And it doesn't really matter because again, we're just using this to estimate a molar absorptivity. So let's just say the path length um, is equal to 1.10 centimeters for our cuvette. Does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable? And that's what you measured, right? Yep. Okay. And that's your inner diameter, right? So in other words, if we're looking straight down on the cuvette, it looks something like this. And of course it has a thickness associated with it. And what you measured is sort of the inner diameter here. And that turned out to be 1.10 centimeters. In other words, if we think about light moving through this, the cuvette's going to be centered. So I'm going to have my eye not coming through like this and my eye that I'm measuring coming out of the cuvette looking like that. OK, so that's the path. So we can use that number in all of our calculations because that's based on a measurement that we made. So it's fine for everybody to use 1.10 centimeters. That's going to get you close enough, OK? So now what I need to do is I got to go back and look at my slope. I got to focus on my slope. So let's look at my units of M. All right, let's go back to our plot. What's a slope? Well, slope is the change in Y over the change in the X. It's the rise over the run, isn't it? Okay, so let's just focus on units here. What are the units on absorbance? There aren't any, right? Yeah, they're unitless. They're unitless because absorbance is a log quantity, right? Absorbance is the negative log of the transmittance, okay? So even if the transmittance had units, it doesn't because it's a ratio of I to I naught or I naught over I or whatever it is. There's no units there. And even if there were, we'd have to eliminate them because we're talking about a log of the number, right? So absorbance is unitless. So my M is going to be a unitless thing on my rise divided by what on my run? What's my runs units going to be? What are my units on the x-axis? Parts per million of iron. Parts per million iron, exactly. So let's go back down and put all that in. So units of M are going to be 1 over PPMFE. 2 plus. OK? Everybody see that? Because mm -hmm. that one is my absorbance, which is unitless. All right, so here's the issue that we have. Let's go back to Beer's Law. And we did this, I think, um, on Monday, but let's solve it for epsilon. So epsilon is equal to absorbance divided by B times C. So what do the units of epsilon have to be? Well, as we know, absorbance is unitless, so we're just going to leave that there. B is in terms of what? Centimeters? Yep. OK. And what's C got to be? Molarity. Well, PPM. Well, it's B. we got to be careful. It's molarity, not PPM. 
because remember we're talking about molar absorptivity. So that means concentration has to be in terms of molarity. Okay, so centimeters times molarity. Oh, and molarity of what? Is a molarity of iron too? It's of the complex. Ah, it's of the complex, isn't it? Yeah, because remember iron too is not absorbent. It's the molarity of the complex ion. In other words, it's the molarity of whatever's doing the absorbing, which is the complex ion in this case, okay? And another way I could write it if I wanted to is I, it's a lot of times you see molarity expressed as moles per liter. So the liter goes to the top. So it can be liters per mole times centimeters, okay? Everybody see how that's the same thing? So that's what I got to get. Okay, that's what I got to get. Epsilon ultimately has to be in terms of those units. Okay, now let's go back to my M. Let's say that we're just gonna have a um, value. I'm just gonna make a value up. Let's say that M is equal to 0.532. Oops. That's a five, that's a three, that's a two. Okay, five, three, two. All right. Now, remember our M is in terms of inverse PPM. So I got to put PPM on the bottom here. And I'll put iron here to remind myself that it's the PPM of the iron. That's what my slope is in terms of. Those are the units of, right? So, I need to get PPM iron in terms of what? I got to move it back around to get it in terms of molarity units, don't I? So I can actually get an epsilon that means something out of this slope. So I got to do a unit conversion here, don't I? So let's just remind ourselves of a few things. Okay, another way of writing PPM iron is I could write it in terms of the milligrams of iron per liter of solution, could it? That was one of my definitions of parts per million if I'm utilizing a um, dilute aqueous solution, which in terms of the iron we are. It's milligrams of iron per liter of solution. Okay, everybody remember that? So if that's the case, if I had inverse parts per million iron, which is what I've actually got, one over PPMFE, that's going to equal to liters of solution per milligrams of iron. Okay, so now what can I do? I can exchange my parts per million out for that. So now my slope becomes this. It's the same number, but now one over parts per million becomes liters of solution over milligrams of Fe. Okay, everybody see what I did there? I'm just trying to move parts per million over into something that looks more like molarity, right? So I'm trying to end up with that molarity term in epsilon has to be in terms of what? Liters and moles, doesn't it? So now I'm getting there because I got the liters on the top. But what do I need to get to in the bottom? I need the moles part, don't I? I need the moles part. Okay, so let's just kind of rewrite this down here. I'm going to leave the solution out. We kind of know it's solution. Okay, so I want liters per mole on. Oh, but it has to be the moles of the absorbing species, doesn't it? So I need to get from milligrams of iron to moles of iron. And then if I got moles of iron, I can go to moles of complex, right? If I got moles to complex, then I'm good. Okay, so let's think about what I have to do here. So we'll work from iron to begin with, because that's what we got from the standard curve. So I know that I've got a thousand milligrams of Fe per gram of Fe, okay, so milligrams, I get rid of that now. Oh, and once I got grams of iron, where can I go from there? Moles. 
moles. Yeah, let's do that. So let's see. I know that for every one mole of Fe that I have, um, periodic table tells me, did I do that right? Let's see. You did the inverse, I think, of what you wanted to do. I think you're right. Let me just see what I've got here. Yes, I got to get grams up top and I want moles in the bottom because I got to get the grams canceled, don't I? So one mole of Fe, thank you, is what, 55.845? grams of Fe, okay? That's better, because now grams will cancel with grams. That's what I needed to do. Okay, so now I've got liters per mole. Oh, that's looking a lot better, because remember, I want to get parts per million over to something that looks well wherever it was. Da, da, da. I don't remember where I put it now. But anyway, I know I need to have liters per mole, right? Oh, but I need it in terms of the complex, right? So, Let's remember now, can I do a mole bridge between moles of iron and moles of complex? Well, yeah, because I know how to form the complex, don't I? So if you go back to that equation where we talked about making the complex way back up here, just to review it, oh, there it is. Can I make a mole bridge between the iron two plus and the complex? Yeah, what's the mole relationship between the two look like? One to one. It's one to one, so I can always go back and review that, yeah. All right, so I want to get rid of moles of iron, so that's got to be on top, right? So one mole of Fe corresponds to one mole of complex. Okay, so now I'm getting this in terms of the thing that's actually doing the absorbing, aren't I? Okay, so now let's see what we got. Moles of iron will cancel with moles of iron. So what do I have? I've got liters per mole of complex. Okay, that's good, because that looks like the inverse molarity of the complex, doesn't it? So if I actually work this out, you guys can check my math here. You get 2.97 times 10 to the fourth, and that's liters per mole of complex. Okay. So that's kind of like inverse molarity, isn't it? So am I done at this point? Well, no, all I've really done is I've kind of taken inverse parts per million and I've turned it into inverse molarity of the thing that's doing the absorber. So remember, we're only really part there, right? So remember my epsilon, and we did this up there before from the equation, is the slope divided by B. Okay, so what I just got is the slope, right? That's the liters per mole part. So what do I have to do? Well, I got to take that and divided by the B, haven't done that. So let's see if the units actually end up working out. So the slope turns out to be the 2.97 times 10 to the fourth. And that's gonna be um, liters per mole of complex. And then I got to take that whole thing and divide it by my path length, don't I? And what do we say that was? 1.10 centimeters. Okay, so now if we put this all together, I'm going to end up getting an epsilon value of 2.48. So that's when you divide the 2.97 times 10 to the fourth, divided by the 1.10. You get 2.48 times 10 to the fourth. And let's look at our um, units now. I get liters, and remember the moles of the complex are really in the bottom. So I get liters per mole of complex times centimeters, which is the correct units for molar absorptivity. Now, what I want you to look at is the magnitude of the number. Is it big or small? It's pretty big. It's pretty big. So what does that tell you? about um, this particular um, complex that I've got. Does it absorb light well at the um, wavelength of interest? Yeah. Yeah, sure does. So it tells me it's got a big molar absorptivity. So the complex that I made actually absorbs a lot of light at that wavelength. And that's kind of what we want to get good sensitivity, okay? So basically it's kind of an interesting little units conversion problem that you have to run through. So essentially what I've done here is exactly what you're gonna to have to do 
um, to calculate your epsilon from your slope. Okay, so you can actually follow this along and see what I did, and that should get you exactly to the epsilon you need to use. The only thing different that you're gonna have to use is your value of slope that you're gonna get from your plot, but the units are gonna be the same, okay? Any questions about that, guys? All good? All right. Now, what was the other thing that we did? So I think that covers everything we have to do with the um, spec 20s. What was the other thing we did at the end? We measured the atomic absorption. Yeah, we looked at atomic absorption, exactly. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Now, the interesting thing about atomic absorption is that you're still using the same analyte solution. So where's the iron in the analyte solution? Well, it's tied up in the complex, isn't it? Okay. But in atomic absorption, what we're actually measuring is the absorbance due to gaseous iron atoms. So how did we get the iron out of solution into the vapor phase and all those bonds broken so that we can get um, iron atom by itself? How did that happen? Combustion. Yeah, we had a flame. Okay, and flames are hot, right? A flame is basically pro the um, byproduct of combustion. So we've got a lot of hot gas there, okay? So basically you got a lot of gaseous components, particles moving around with a lot of kinetic energy. So there's a lot of collisional energy happening there, right? So ultimately what can happen is there's enough energy in that flame to be able to desolvate and break bonds. So we got a flame, so we'll go ahead and kind of show the instrument. So we got the slot burner here. And the burner has the flame above it, sort of looked like that. And then there was kind of an inner cone associated with the flame that was kind of light blue. And then it was kind of a darker blue on top, you guys probably saw. And then we had a little sample sipper in here, right? So basically we took our beaker and put it down here with our sample in it. And we were able to basically sip the sample up into the flame. Okay, so again, what are the processes occurring in the flame? We can say that the complex is first desolvated. So we got to take all the um, solvent molecules away from it, right? So we can isolate the complex. Then we have to vaporize it. After we vaporize the complex, the next thing that we have to do is then we have to break all the bonds. The next thing then is that we have iron in there, but the iron might be in the two plus or the three plus or heaven only knows what ionic state. So the next thing that we have to do is we actually have to reduce the iron. So we'll say it's Fe two plus to Fe zero uncharged also in the gaseous state. So two electrons are required to do that. So reduction reaction, right? Okay, so it turns out the flame actually supplies the electrons that are required to do that, okay? And then the next thing that has to happen is we have to excite the iron and we do it by absorbing light, okay? So what ends up happening here is I have the iron in the zero state gaseous and then I'm going to supply some light, which will represent as a photon H nu here. And that photon, if it's of the correct energy, will be absorbed by the ground state iron atom. And we can actually take that iron atom and we can put it into some sort of an excited state, which I'll represent by the star there. So 
So again, what happens to that photon in that transition? Well, it gets absorbed, doesn't it? So if that photon gets absorbed, that means it doesn't get seen by the detector. All right, so let's go back and kind of look at the different parts of this thing again. So it looks a lot like the SPEC-20, really, but that's all the process that's happening inside the flame. But on the other side of this, I'm going to have a light source. It's actually an iron specific light source called a hollow cathode lamp. Okay, so it actually gives off a line spectrum for iron. So I'll have light coming out of it. Then I'm going to have a wavelength selector here, like we had before. So I can make sure I'm getting the right wavelength out. And then that's going to send photons of the correct energy through the flame. They're going to get absorbed there. So I'm going to have an I naught there. Then what's going to come out of this is going to be a certain intensity that's attenuated because presumably I've got ground state iron atoms in the flame now, right? So some of those ground state iron atoms are going to absorb that light. So now the intensity coming out of the flame is going to be less than the intensity going into the flame at my analytical wavelength, okay? So then from here, all I have to do is send that light to a detector. And then we can have a readout that gives, for example, absorbance. And that's what we actually measured from the instrument. Okay, so in that sense, it's all the normal components we have in a regular optical spectrometer like the SPEC-20 we talked about. The difference is in the nature of what's happening to the sample, right? We're not actually measuring the um, absorbance of the complex anymore. Now we're measuring the absorbance of vapor phase ground state iron atoms. Okay, so that's what's happening, by the way, if you guys don't remember, that's the flame that you guys saw. And just as an aside there, because it's interesting, I think I mentioned it to you guys when you're in there. <clears throat> when you dip the sample sipper into your solutions, what happened to the flame? It turned orange. Yeah, it turned really bright yellow orange, didn't it? <clears throat> Did anybody remember what I said that was due to? Sodium. Yeah, what you're doing there is you're looking at the emission of sodium atoms. So remember, you got sodium in there from the buffer, right? Because the buffer is made up of sodium acetate. So what happens is sodium atoms go up into the flame, okay? Because they're getting atomized as well, just like the iron is. And what ends up happening there is the flame itself has enough energy to excite the sodium atoms, okay? So it promotes electrons up to a higher energy level. And then what happens is those electrons make their way back down and give off resonant light. And the light that you see given off <clears throat> in that bright yellow flame there was due to the emission of the photons from the excited state sodium atoms that were in there. Okay, so that's kind of neat. You're actually looking at sodium atom emission, okay, which is kind of the opposite of what's happening with the iron atom. Now, you might argue, well, why isn't the flame exciting the iron atom? Why do I need to have that external light source to do that? Well, it turns out iron's a lot harder to excite because it's a transition metal. So the flame has a lot of energy, but it's not energetic enough to promote the electrons in the case of the iron atom. So I need that external light source to do it for me, okay? Now, what's the only other difference? Well, you're gonna, in terms of the data workup that you're gonna do from the atomic absorption, is it gonna differ from the data workup that you, you did from the SPEC-20? You're gonna do pretty much the same thing or something different? Pretty much the same thing. Yeah, you're gonna make a standard curve, right? And I think one of the things that, and you're also gonna be able to calculate a concentration of your iron from the standard curve, and you can use it to compare back to the iron concentration you get from the um, SPEC-20. But um, the other thing I ask you to do is to calculate a molar absorptivity. <clears throat> now, in this case, remember the molar absorptivity is for the iron atom in there because we don't have the complex anymore, do we? Okay, so you don't have to worry about um, relating that because now you've got the iron by itself in there, okay? So you're gonna get a different kind of molar absorptivity because there's no complex anymore. Now, what's the other thing you have to account for? 
when you do that molar absorptivity calculation. What's different here from what you did um, or what you measured in the case of the SPEC 20? Obviously the absorbance will be different, right? Well, what else is different? Significant figures. Yeah, your sig figs are gonna be different, right? Because you picked off a different number of sig figs. That's true, so that's your sensitivity. What else is different between the two experiments? All of those are correct. What else is different? Transmission. How about path length? So you had a cuvette in the case of the SPEC 20, but what's the path length in the case of the um, AA? It's the slot width or length. It's the length of the slot of the burner. Okay, so in this case, your path length is equal to the burner slot. length. And the burner slot length turned out to be 10.00 centimeters. So when you do your molar absorptivity calculation, remember that you're using a different path length in the case of the atomic absorption instrument. It's about 10 times as big. And that's on purpose because the molar absorptivity, as you guys saw, is nowhere near as big for the iron atom as it is the complex. And one way to compensate for that is to, um, to get a measurable absorbance is to increase the path length by a factor of 10. So that's why the burner slot length is long like that, as opposed to just being cylindrical, like in the case of a Bunsen burner. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so I think that's everything you guys need to actually work up this lab um, data-wise and have it ready for next week. Um, I will get out the next lab for you. It's actually going to be an enzymatic analysis of um, glucose. So I think what we'll do is you'll get an, un, you'll get, it, every person will get an unknown for that, just like you normally would. So we can do accuracy and precision on this one. <clears throat> but on top of that, um, I think I'm gonna thaw the kombucha we used last time. And we're gonna look at the kombucha too, because I think we can do a glucose um, analysis on the kombucha. So you'll have an unknown and then each bench will have a kombucha sample to look at. So we'll try to get you the same kombucha samples that you um, were using for the other two analyses. And that'll um, give us just another piece of data. And it'll also let me know whether this experiment is applicable to the kombucha to see if I can do a whole module on that. So you guys are kind of guinea pigging the kombucha for me on this next one. But I think it'll be an interesting experiment and you'll have a glucose unknown anyway to fall back on. All right, so I'll get that up for you in the next day or two so you guys will have that. And um, remember also for next Tuesday, um, the assigned homework is due. And that's got, I think, some EDTA stuff on it and also some Iron Lab stuff on it. All right, any other questions, guys? Okay, today is Wednesday, so I'll see you on Monday then. Have a good day. All right, everybody have a good one then. All right, so um, I, I'm dumb, um, so I was just going to have a quick question. Um